the heavens and show us His glory, show us His power. Serving his kingdom. 
And so, um, do you understand that when you actually go and do what he tells you to do, it actually builds your maturity. Okay, it's not like you've got to choose maturity or serving. Um, discipleship versus evangelism. No, those things are not at odds. When you do that, it grows you. It grows this church. It grows us more into the likeness of Christ. And so, um, we want to encourage you, if you're not engaged in a small group, get in one. Okay? Um, that's the way we do community together. If, um, if you're not serving somewhere in the church, if you're not serving the body of Christ in some way, let us help you figure that out. Okay, that's why we're here. Um, doing, we do a lot about missions, right? We, I mean, we push a lot about missions, and some of y'all might even think maybe too much. How can we do that too much? Okay, it'd be like we preach the gospel too much. Come on, you can't do that too much, all right? And so um, when you get engaged in missions on whatever level that is, it actually helps mature the church. And so one of the ways that's going to happen here soon is we have this amazing international mission opportunity right here in our backyard. Okay? Um, SIN North America, that's our North American Mission Board, a Baptist North American Mission Board. Um, they uh, have a group they call SIN, and we have a couple of missionaries, um, Tim and Jody Cross, who one of the, the main focus of their mission is to help these refugees that the United States government has brought into our midst. These are legal refugees who are escaping war. They're escaping horrors that you and I can scarcely imagine. And they've got their family, and they've, they've been brought here, and they don't know how to shop at a Walmart. They don't know how to do these things, okay? Um, they don't have anything when they get here. And so we have an opportunity to learn more about what it means to maybe partner with them here in our own backyard and how we can be a part of that process. So April 30th, that's a Tuesday night, April 30th. It's in your bulletin, but I really want to draw your attention to it. A lot of times each month we might have a men's event and a women's event on a Tuesday night or Monday night. This month, April 30th, we're going to do a, just a men's, women, kids event, okay? Um, we're going to put it all together, and Tim and Jody are going to come and explain the what and the how and what it looks like and the impact that it has and the opportunity that it has. So this would be a really neat opportunity to find out how we are meeting the needs of people who are in desperate need and opportunities to share the gospel with them as time goes on. Um, it's a neat ministry. It's an international mission trip right here in Pendleton, Central Clemson. All right? You don't have to drive or get on a plane and go really far. It's right here. All right? So April 30th, here at the church in the Fellowship Building, we'll have a meal. Um, we'll have child care for the youngest. And then we will, um, the kids actually have heard a little bit from Tim and Jody and GAs and RAs. And so they'll be a part of that as well. So you get to eat and then hear about this. And so I know it's a little different, so we wanted to emphasize it a little bit. Make sure everybody understood. And if you have any questions about that, please let us know. But there's some neat opportunities on the horizon for this, okay? So really cool. I think you all got to go this week. And you had how many people there? 51. 51 people went and to go prepare a house for one of these families. All right? And it was just, it was a lot of cleanup that was needed. And so a lot of opportunity here. So um, mark that down in your calendar. April 30th is a Tuesday night um, at the end of this month, and uh, we'll hear about that. So one day make you aware, all right? But understand, that is part of how we glorify our Father. That is how we expand His kingdom, and that's how we grow in more and more in the likeness of Christ is when we do the things He said to do. Amen? Amen. All right. So isn't He good? Yes. Maybe. Maybe. Isn't He good? He is good. He is good. Amen. So let's... Let's go in the goodness of God's one. Let's worship Him for what He's doing and what He will do and rejoice in that. Amen? Let's do it.
Savior, sitting at the right hand of the Father, forever glorified. Let's praise Him. Let's sing to Him.
So, years ago, um, my father-in-law passed away six months after Jennifer and I were married. It's very sudden. Um, his funeral was very difficult, but it was amazing as well. See, Tony had impacted so many people. Uh, the visitation went on for hours. Uh, as probably nearly a thousand people, literally, uh, came through to pay their respects to the family. And Tony wasn't a famous person. He just impacted so many people in the 47 years of his life. And I remember feeling that tremendous loss. The, the loss that my wife was going through, my, my newlywed wife, but also the loss I felt because Tony had impacted me greatly as well. He had poured into me ways and, and poured into me in ways that others had not. And I remember thinking this just wasn't fair that such a good man died so early. He'd not even seen his first grandchild. And I remember thinking, what a great grandfather he would be. And Tony and his death made me reassess my understanding of God and his sovereignty over our lives. Tony's death made me angry, to be honest. I had to process that for quite a while. And God um, used that to help me think about our purpose in life. And at the same time this was going on, um, my wife and I had a friend who's, who was about our age, and their father was rotten. This person's father was an alcoholic and was in and out of their family's life and just caused trouble for them. And I remember thinking while that was going on, why did Tony die so young and this terrible man just goes on living? We've been looking at Ecclesiastes and we are in chapter 7 today. Now, So far we've been challenged to consider if we value God most or do we value other things more. And the text has challenged us to surrender to God's grace and put Him above all things. The text has challenged us to surrender to God's grace and even the grace to properly enjoy the things He gives us. He blesses us with so many things and even blesses us with that capacity to enjoy them. And there's another layer to the process that Ecclesiastes is going to expose. And again, it's a wisdom book in the Old Testament. And it challenges us through what can seem like pessimism, right? I mean, it seems like, what a downer this book is. Um, but this, is, this approach just accentuates the reality that you and I are not in control. The main character of this book is called the Preacher. He takes us on a journey that attempts to show us that there's only one way to truly find meaning and purpose in this life. And on that journey, he's showing us repeatedly, different from different angles, the same thing. He's showing us that we cannot control death, we cannot control time, and we cannot control what seems random in this life. Tony's funeral brought that truth to my attention. We cannot stop death. We cannot stop the march of time. We cannot control the fact that a good man, such as Tony, dies early while an evil man sometimes lives a very long life. And the preacher points out to us in Ecclesiastes that when we try to control these things, or when we try to escape these things, it's just hevel. Say the word hevel. Hevel. Y'all should know that word by now, right? I hope. It's the Hebrew word that just means vapor or smoke. <coughs> And trying to control death, time, or the events of this life is trying to, it's like trying to hold on to vapor in your hand. You just cannot do it. So let's look at Ecclesiastes 7. There's a, there's a, we don't have time to go through the entire passage, but understand that we'll have a little part two next week on this. But Ecclesiastes 7 is about giving us the secret to living our short, out-of-our-control lives. So we're going to start in verses 1 through 4. Chapter 7, verses 1 through 4. This is what it says. A good name is better than precious ointment, and the day of death than the day of birth. It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting, for this is the end of all mankind, and the living will lay it to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, for by sadness of face the heart is made glad. 
The heart of the wise is in the house of the morning, but the heart of fools is in the house of myrrh. My Father in heaven, I pray that you bless your word to our understanding. Most of all, Lord, I pray that we be transformed and we would act on it. And we ask all of this in the name of your Son who makes it possible. That's Jesus Christ. Amen. So in chapter 7, the first place that the preacher takes us is to a funeral. And he calls it good. He starts with this expression that honestly would not have been debatable in their day. He starts with this expression in verse 1 that says, A good name is better than precious ointment. Now a good name refers to a good character, an authentic reputation, not a put on, an authentic good character. And um, the precious ointment is a fragrant oil or a reference to wealth. So he's saying that both are good. He's not saying like, oh, a good name is good and, and wealth is evil. No, no, no. He's saying they're both good. But he's saying that the good character, the truly good character is worth way more. Now that would not have been debated in their honor-shame culture that day. They valued their honor more than they did money. Okay? Um, and he uses this to say, okay, you know this is true basically. In the same way, the day of death is better than the day of birth. That's the shocking part. Why is the day of death better than the day of birth? Well, he's saying that at funerals, it's way more instructive. Funerals are way more instructive than baby showers. They're way more instructive about purpose of life. And the next three verses is going to expand upon this funeral idea. So going to a person's house of mourning. That's a, that's a person who's lost a family member. They're having a funeral. And going to their house for a funeral is way more instructive than going to their house for a party. Wise people take to heart the brevity of life. And that's what a funeral reminds us of. Wise people accept the fact that they are not in control of death, time, or the events of this world. Fools try to party away or pretend away the reality that we're all going to die. Fools try to insulate themselves from death's inevitability. You know, the people that seem to be most afraid of death are the ones who've spent their lives pretending it away. Because they have no hope when death comes and takes a loved one. They have no hope when the cancer diagnosis comes. Because they've spent their life pretending this away and acting like it's never going to happen to them. And because they've denied that reality, they live a life without real purpose. And they are in a daze about life because they deny death's inevitability over their life. They're literally intoxicated by denial. But a funeral, the day of death, sobers us up from the stupor of denial. Some who attend funerals are, have been so, in, I've watched this happen, they've been so intoxicated by this denial of death that a one-hour funeral only might get them to the hangover for a few minutes, and they're, they're imbibing this denial before the dirt even covers the coffin. They leave there unchanged, unfazed, because, by golly, that ain't going to happen to me. Now, they would never intellectually say that, but that's how they live their life, pretending this away. The wise person will not run from death when it presents itself. The wise person sees the death of friends and loved ones as a constant reminder of death's inevitability of us all. And then it takes us further if we're in Christ because Psalm 90, Ecclesiastes is a book, Ephesians 5, 15 through 16. There are so many passages that call us to live wisely because time is short. Moses, the psalm attributed to Moses, Psalm 90, he said... Lord, teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. Don't act like the days are unlimited. They're not. The Christ follower grieves the loss of loved ones because death separates us from our loved ones. But Christ followers are sober-minded about the precious time that God has given us to do His will and not our own. Christ followers grieve, but we grieve with hope because we know that death does not have the final say over this world. Christ followers know that life is short, but we do not use that as an excuse to party or shirk away responsibility. You only live once is not a justification for vacation. 
Christ followers replace you only live once with you only get one life to live for Christ. And the secret to life, the secret to navigating this short, out of our control life is to surrender to the truth that you're not in control and life is short. Just surrender to that. And it doesn't matter how much you want to change it. It doesn't matter what you do. That will not change it. You've obviously heard the, par the marathon runner who gets a heart attack at 40, right? You've heard about those who are health freaks and they eat all the best food but they still get cancer and die early. I mean, you can't control it. But then you have these other people like my great-grandfather who ate fat, fat back bacon and eggs every morning of his life. He even, he even drank moonshine for a while when he was younger. Almost died from it. He lived to 101. I obviously do not have his genes. Let me tell you something. Oh, he had a full head of hair too. All right? You and I don't get to control these things, and it's just delusional to think that we can. And when we live in that delusion, we cannot expect to have a clear picture of our purpose in this world. It is heaven to try. You cannot make life last longer. You can't control death, time, or events. Only God is sovereign over all these things. And the sooner we accept this, the sooner we ac access the wisdom and peace He wants to give us. And that worldview changes our perceptions and priorities. And when your perceptions and priorities get transformed, your daily decisions get transformed. This, this trickles down to how you spend every dime and time. Okay? And that's what the next verse is going to tackle, the next couple verses. In verses 5 and 6, it says this. It is better for a man to hear the rebuke of the wise than to hear the song of fools. For as the cracking of thorns under a pot, so is the laughter of the fools, and this also is vanity. We don't like hearing a word of rebuke. We'd rather go to the party. We'd rather sing the songs. But if you think about dry thorns under a pot, you light them up, it, it flares up. You know, if you ever dry, if you ever burn dry brush, you can see this. It just flares up. It's really bright for a second, then it's gone. And there's not a whole lot of heat. And your dinner don't get cooked when you're cooking over one of those. All right? And by the way, the rebuke that transforms your life, that you take to heart and you and you accept the discipline and you accept the, the correction from someone who loves you and has godly wisdom, that lasts a lifetime. It's ultimately better for us to be rebuked than to be at a party. Now, there's nothing wrong with having fun. But sadly, many of us use fun to distract us from our uncertainties and our fear of purpose. We selfishly do not want God to determine our purpose, and deep down there is a conviction that comes with that, that we're not willing to admit or acknowledge, but it's there. So we distract ourselves from that conviction because we don't like the yucky feeling that it brings. So we rationalize our disobedience away, and the rebuke from godly and wise people in our lives, even though it's a gift that will have the greatest impact um, for our good than any momentary gratification, we still ignore it. And in a way, this preacher in Ecclesiastes is rebuking us here. He is calling us out of the common ways that we um, skate through life, chasing heaven. And this leads to a series of statements that comes next in the passage. First off, we can chase it in all kinds of ways. But power, having control and authority over some things, it just fuels our delusion of our control sometimes. It, it corrupts people. It can even corrupt the wise he is saying in verse 7, it says, Surely oppression drives the wise into madness, and a bribe corrupts the heart. Now, this is not the only place that a proverb like this is mentioned in Scripture. But even a wise person can become a fool when they think that they actually control things. So instead, verse 8 challenges us to have a bigger perspective and be patient instead of proud. It says, Better is the end of a thing than its beginning. And the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. You see, the end of the thing shows us a bigger perspective about the thing, right? So the end of someone's life gives us a bigger perspective about their life. We do not always have access to that perspective. We can't know what's going to happen in the future. We can't always see now what will be. 
So the simple steps of obedience to God today, we just have to take them in faith, but it will lead to perhaps a stronger life in prayer and generosity. It can lead to greater maturity, but we can't always see the maturity now. That's later. The end of a thing is better than the beginning. The simple steps of obedience just lead to more. And we've got to trust God with it. Consistent parenting now can gradually produce young adults who go into the service of God's kingdom. But when you're raising them, when you're in the thick of the battle, you don't see it. Sometimes you get downright discouraged as a parent. We cannot see how church planting will work. But in a few years, we'll look back and see that what we started now it paid off in ways we never expected. And this leads to his statement in verse 9. Be not quick in your spirit to become anger, angry, for anger lodges in the hearts of fools. We get angry when our expectations are not met. So we must always be aware of and assess our expectations. What are they? Why do we have them? And where do they come from? Our expectations can often be built on unspoken assumptions that we have control over things that we actually do not. We can have clearer expectations when we accept the, the fact that there are many things, most things are completely out of our control. And what God has charged us to steward is what we've been charged to steward. And even the results of our stewardship of that is still up to Him. And even the wisdom to steward, it comes from Him. That's why John 15 says, you must abide in me because you can do nothing apart from me. And abiding in him means double checking with Jesus before you go and go out to eat. Or double checking with Jesus before you go and do something. Asking Jesus for what you need to be able to do what he's called you to do. And actually relying on him and realizing, I can't do this. Only by the power of Christ can I do this. Anger most often stems from that assumption we can control things that only God can control. And this is why he says that anger lodges in the heart of a fool. Proverbs 14, 17 says, A man of quick temper acts foolishly. Pride and a lack of perspective often drive our anger in our lives. Because we haven't let our expectations be changed. That's why a patient spirit is better than a prideful spirit. One of the ways you can tell whether you trust, it is, one of the ways you can tell is whether we trust God's timing and sovereignty is just see how angry we get when things don't go our way. It could be anything from your tire going flat to your kid rebels. Or maybe someone you loved, like Tony, died at 47 years old. Can we really trust the God who spoke it all into existence, who says, I am here, and I am all-powerful, and I'm above all things, and there's nothing in your life that takes me off guard? Do we really trust him or not? Look at your anger, and you'll see if you trust him or not. And this is related to this warning in verse 10. It says, Say not, why were the former days better than these? For it is not from wisdom that you ask this. When we put these verses together, verses 8 through 10, this is what we see. Church people often violate verse 8 with their pessimism about the future. Or they violate verse 10 by succumbing to the temptation of nostalgia about the past. <coughs> Their pessimism about the future may sound like church planting is never going to work here. It's amazing how we can tell God won't work, won't work you know? Um, or going to two services on Sunday morning will split the church. The other side of that, verse 10, nostalgia comes out as, as we talk about the good old days. And getting back to the things the way they used to be. We are delusional when we do this. And I'm not, I didn't choose that word without thought. It literally is delusional. There was an evil in the good old days that we have forgotten. 
We have, we have decided to pretend all the junk that used to go on in the good old days. There has always been evil and sin in this world. And while some sins trend a little more at different times in history and different societies, there is nothing new under the sun. That sounds like something we've read in Scripture here recently. There is nothing new, Ecclesiastes, under the sun. Our society has not invented new ways to sin. Being a Christ follower is not about going back to the way things used to be, but about being made new. Following Christ means change. Following Christ means putting off the old self and putting the new self on. Try, try, try that, driving down the road. Okay, just try this. All right? I'm kidding. Don't do this. But if you drive down the road and you look over your shoulder the entire time, you're going to come to a tragic conclusion. Looking back doesn't get you where you need to be. Can you learn from the past? Absolutely. But not for the desire of, I want it to be like it used to be. There's a, there's a long-running illustration of this in the Bible. It's a long-running plot of the Old Testament about the construction of the temple of God that shows us this. God gave Moses the blueprints for his temple up on Mount Sinai. And this was going to be the meeting place between God and his people. And so Moses built a mobile version of it. We call it tabernacle. And this was a mobile worship center. This is where God's presence would dwell among his people. And so they built it and they, it traveled with them when they went through the wilderness. This is great. All right, they left Egypt out of slavery, victorious, and God is with them the whole way. Even in the midst of their rebellion. But centuries after Moses, King Solomon comes along and he built a permanent temple in Jerusalem. And it was known for its grandeur. This temple was later then torn down by the Babylonians. I mean, can you imagine? Oh, if we just build this building, it's going to be all right. And then the Babylonians tear it down. And then God worked through two men, Ezra and Nehemiah, to return to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. But those, and we find this out in those books, that some who saw this new, the second temple, this, this new temple, complained because it just wasn't as grand as the first one. It's not like it was in the good old days. You know, back when Solomon had a thousand women in his life, back when all the, the kings of Israel of Judah and Jerusalem were worshiping idols back in the good old days, right? When everybody was so faithful. Isn't it amazing how we can cloud our understanding of what's true? Do you know the word nostalgia, by the way? Just, I heard this the other day. They were doing a whole report about the history of nostalgia. You were going to say, okay, you were a total nerd if you listen to that. I am. So the word nostalgia came up and was the name of a disease that afflicted soldiers on the field. It was, it was from a bacteria, and they, they called it this because it made them long for home and they couldn't do their jobs. Like it was just the psychological impact of this literal disease in their life. So nostalgia is not a good thing. I'm just going to say it, all right? So here, here's where it goes. It's back in the good old days, Solomon's temple is what they were looking for, but they had no idea about the glory that was going to come in the second temple. Yeah, it was smaller. But you know what? God in the flesh would walk through this temple. Jesus Christ would come and walk into that temple. God's glory would come in ways they never expected. Now it didn't happen for almost 500 years. Ezra and Nehemiah didn't get to see that. And some of the things we're going to do today as the people of God, we won't get to see the full results in our lifetime. What we do today is going to impact generations to come. If we are faithful, it will impact them well. If we are unfaithful, it won't impact them for the kingdom. It's up to us to pass it on. When Jesus came to that temple, by the way, guess what he did not say? I'm going to take you back to the way things used to be. That was not the message of the gospel. He didn't say, hey, I'm going to do things the way you prefer. That's not the message of the gospel. No, he declared, this world is broken.
and he came and proclaimed to fulfill God's plan of redemption for it. He proclaimed that things were going to be different now because God's promises and plans were moving forward. He did not promise to take Israel backwards. He was moving things forwards. He said, you cannot put new wine into old wineskins. That's a figure of speech. He's talking about the new covenant that he has brought. And the Old Testament prophet of Jeremiah declared that God would make a new covenant with Israel, not like the old covenant that they broke. No, Jesus referred to this when he celebrated the Passover with his disciples on the night he was arrested. He gave his disciples the cup of wine and said, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. You see all the connections there? This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. That cup represented the covenant that Jeremiah promised. The cup of red wine represented Jesus' red blood that he spilt the next day as the Romans scourged him and nailed him to a cross. They thought that they were getting rid of a troublemaker. But Jesus, Jesus had made bold claims that they did not like, so they killed him. But this was part of the promise and plan all along. This new covenant was so important that it had to be sealed by his own blood. His people and his creation were so important that it had to be sealed by his own blood. You are so important that he had to seal you with his spilt blood and his death on the cross to give you new life if, as part of that covenant. Funerals confront our illusions of control. Jesus' funeral confronts us most of all. I lamented that I did not understand why my father-in-law, Tony, died while other evil people were still living. But you know what's even more amazing? That Jesus, who was sinless and perfect, died because we were so sinful. He hung on that cross and his blood flowed down. The promise and plan of God was being fulfilled in that moment. We deserve death for our sin, but Jesus bore the death for us. He paid the debt. He paid the wages of sin in full. Death is defeated. Death has no victory when Christ is Lord over our lives. And only through him can we find forgiveness and new life. Only through him can we find purpose. Only through death can we find life. His death makes it possible for us to die to our old selves and become new. So we must die to the delusion that we have control over everything. We must die to the delusion that we can live any way we want as a Christ follower. His grace is not a license to sin. We must die to the illusion that our life is our own. For we were bought at a price and it was the shed blood and death of Jesus Christ on the cross. When we truly surrender to that reality, then we begin to find the peace and the purpose for our short, out-of-our-control lives. This is how Paul talked about it in Corinthians. He said, for the love of Christ controls us. Let that sink in for a minute. Not your agenda, not your preference, not your past, not your co-worker, no, 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 that doesn't control us. The love of Christ, if you're a Christ follower, the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but live for him who for their sake died and was raised. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. All this is from self-help? No, all this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ God, was in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting the trust, their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, 
God making his appeal through us. So we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him who knew no sin to be sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Don't wait for your funeral to ponder the purpose of your life. We must die before we die. We must die to our old self and be made new in Christ. We must die to our delusions of control, for the love of Christ must control us. And if you've never done this, let this be the day, let this be the morning. But if you are claiming to be a Christ follower, then are you truly living as a new creation? Are you letting God's purpose shape all that you do? Are you seeking the rebuke of wisdom, or are you seeking the next distraction? Are you living in pride and anger? Or are you living in patience and perspective that God's sovereignty gives? Are you pessimistic about the future? Are you bowing to the idol of nostalgia? Or are you seeking the, with joy what God wants to do next? Our next step is to surrender our short, out-of-our-control life to Him. I don't know what that looks like for you today, but it's time to do it. I'm going to pray and you respond. This altar is open. If you have a question, if you need something, come on up. But let's not do these decisions by ourselves. My Father in heaven, I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your love. Lord, I thank you that you are sovereign and in control. You see what we don't see. Lord, help us surrender to that now. Help us to trust you like never before. Lord, let it shape our lives. Forgive us for chasing heaven. Forgive, it, forgive us for bowing down to other things. Lord, in this moment right now, change us and equip us for what's next. Lord, we joyfully rejoice in what you're about to do. And so in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Let's sing together.
um, making a difference. So as we give and we offer, um, let it be cheerfully with excitement about what God is going to do because he has control. Let him control this part as well. My Father in heaven, Lord, thank you for your control and your sovereignty. Lord, I pray that you would use what is given here to glorify your name, to impact people with the gospel both here and around the world. Lord, to meet needs where it's needed. And Lord, that you would be glorified and pleased with it all. Lord, as we give now, let it be pleasing to you, transformative for us, and expanding of your kingdom. And we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Oh, what a Savior is a Take of this. If you're not sure, don't. Or if you know you're not a believer, don't partake of it. Because this is a covenant meal that is celebrated between God's people and Him. But if you've got questions about that, don't leave here without asking about that. Why is it that way? We'll be glad to help. Okay? So this is for believers. So with that said, um, we are going to pass out these elements. And I uh, want you to ponder the fact that He gave His body. For us. That's how much you're you valued by him.
And he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. Just for the record, Bobby won. He got the most out. So, um, <laughs> overachiever. Uh, this is good. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Our gracious Lord, we thank you. For this new covenant that you made possible. Lord, as we go forth from this place, use this time of celebrating that covenant to fuel and empower what we do. Give us a bigger perspective. Give us patience to trust your sovereignty and your control. And Lord, that you would use us in mighty ways this week to further your kingdom, to proclaim it, to be your hands and feet, and to be a testimony to the world of how good and gracious you are. 
Lord, I thank you for this reminder. I'm thanking you right now. We get to celebrate you here and when we walk out this door into the world we go into. Lord, let your love control us. And we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, our King of kings, our Lord of lords. Amen.
I mean, I should be embarrassed because this is what they do. Yeah. Yeah.